Hacking in competitive Pokémon has existed since its inception, and continues now even into Sword and Shield, the most recent games with official formats. This is despite Game Freak having made considerable efforts to improve the ease at which players are able to obtain competitive Pokémon. So today, I'm going to be recreating the 2022 World Championship team to see just how much Sword and Shield actually improved team acquisition by comparing the time it took me to build this team to the time it took me to build Wolf Glick's 2016 World Winning Team. So if you haven't seen that video first, check it out. I'll be building this team from scratch on an almost completed copy of Pokémon Sword. I say almost because I didn't actually finish the Crown Tundra plot, which slightly limits my options for Dynite or Collection later on in the game. I'm going to be matching the stats, EVs, natures, moves, and abilities of all of Edu's Pokémon exactly. My goal is to show all the resources a player would need to acquire to start building a team, and then show along how one team would take. I want to capture the feeling of a new player just starting out VGC for the first time with this type of video. With all that said, I want to lay down my ground rules. Sword and Shield are very buggy games, and a lot of these bugs and exploits make obtaining items or Pokémon extremely fast and easy. I understand that most players use these tricks to their advantage, but because what I want to do is analyze what Game Freak thought was acceptable for team building, I won't be using the day skip trick in most instances. I can't use it to farm Watts, spam Poke jobs, or item farm. In fact, the only time I'm allowing myself to use the date skip is if I RNG manipulate a raid. Is it a bit arbitrary to allow it for raids and not for anything else? Yeah, but I like RNG manips and it's my video, so I'm going to be allowing it. Aside from date skip, I'll also be banning any other glitches, and the only one I can even think of is the clone glitch using Pokemon Camp, uh, but if there's anything else, I wouldn't use it anyway. Lastly, no using Pokemon Home or any other games like Pokemon Legends Arceus or Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl if it can be helped. Alright, well, am I allowing anything interesting then? Yes, I am. I'll be allowing RNG manips as always, both Raid and Overworld RNG are fine. In addition, because Sword and Shield are still the active games in the community when I was taking on this challenge, I'll be allowing the help of other online players because I'll need it, and this is because of the team. Edu has a Zacian, which can only be obtained in Sword, but he also has a Thunderous, which either has to come from an older game or from Shield's Dynamax Adventure. It is not in Sword at all. In addition, his team has a Grookey and an Incineroar. He also must have had to trade or use another game for those Pokémon as well, because the Alolan starter that you get in the Isle of Armor has to be the same type as your Galarian starter. So if I picked Grookey as my starter, I would be getting Rowlet instead. So I had to trade for this Incineroar. Lastly, I want to try and build this team as fast as I can. I'll be running a live timer at all times on the screen and keeping track of how long each task generally took me. With all that done, let's begin the setup. The first thing I had to do was find Edu's team, which was very easy. He posted it himself to Twitter in a Poke paste. After taking a look at the team, I began to plan my route and figure out how I would acquire each Pokemon along with their items and moves. After I did that, I booted up Sword to begin my journey, but then I realized I needed to do the Battle Tower first. You see, in order to know what IVs my Pokemon have without using an external calculator, I need access to the Judge feature of the PC. In order to unlock this feature, I have to rank up to the Pokeball tier in the tower by defeating Leon. This took about 28 minutes, and that's all I really needed to get started. After doing those few tower matches, I took an Air Taxi to the Crown Tundra and began resetting for Calyrex. Edu's Calyrex has one notable feature I am looking for in it, a zero attack IV. Since I intend to use the new Bottle Cap mechanic and the Mint feature to change Calyrex's nature and other IVs, attack is the only stat that I care about. And before anyone says it, no, I can't synchronize the Calyrex. For whatever reason, Synchronize only works on Wild Encounters and doesn't work on any of the Static Legends in this game. I don't know why. Because there's no way to Bottle Cap a stat to zero, I thought the Attack stat was the most important thing to reset for, so I'll just forego everything else in lieu of that. And it's actually a bit easier than aiming for a zero IV. We can aim for any stat from zero to three. This is because VGC is played at level 50, and sometimes at that level, stats can just be the same. It's very circumstantial and every Pokemon is different, but I just used an IV calculator to check what IVs were acceptable. On top of that, my friend pre-calculated the acceptable results so I wouldn't have to use an IV calculator on every catch. So I would just catch and then I would check the summary screen to see if the attack lined up. If not, I'd close the game and do it again. All in all, this took me 31 minutes of resetting to get this Calyrex. After that, I moved on to Thunderous, who is located in the Dynamax Adventure. Luckily, one of my viewers happened to have a Thunderous raid, and I could join in. So we got together a squad and made our way through the adventure. Now is a good time to mention that I stream the whole challenge right here on YouTube. You can catch me live every Tuesday through Saturday at 12 p.m. EST. Catch me doing other team building challenges, nuzlocks, or different challenge runs. Hope to see you there. So the thing about Dynamax Adventures is that they are pretty time consuming. The whole thing, just to catch one Thunderous, took me 26 minutes. I was not about to do that multiple times, so I just caught the first one I saw and I figured I'd have to clean it up with mints and bottle caps later on. Alright, after those two, I thought I would shift gear towards some of the breeds I'm going to need to do. Before I did them though, I realized I would need to get a good ditto, and to do that, I'll be doing some raid RNG. The setup for the raid RNG involves needing a ton of EXP candy, because the raid RNG process itself involves knowing exact IVs. Luckily, this doesn't waste too much time, because I'd have to do this again inevitably to get any Pokemon who I want to bottle cap to level 100. I ended up doing this 
for three and a half hours. I was spamming Crown Tundra raids because Delibird, who spawns there, gives the most candies and best rewards. The reality is that this is both good and bad. Raids give a ton of rewards aside from just candies. They give me tons of technical records, items to sell like nuggets, and a lot of watts. But it just takes so long and it's so boring. Raids are so slow and half the fun is doing them online with friends. But doing them with friends is slow and it's really, really fast to just spam them solo with Zacian. So that's what I did. But after all that, I'm ready for the two raid RNGs I'll have to do. Before I do the raid RNG, I think it's worth giving a breakdown of how Sword and Shield's RNG works and how I manipulate it in this video so you can follow along a little bit better. Sword and Shield use two different types of RNG, a Crypto Secure RNG native to the Switch's internal functions and a Zoro Shiro 128 generator used to advance the RNG forward. Now, the Crypto Secure RNG as its name might suggest, cannot be reversed or manipulated in any way. And while static encounters like Calyrex and the Eggs from Breeding both only use the seed generated by this Crypto Secure function of the Switch, Overworld RNG calls and raids both feed this Crypto Seed into a Zoro Shiro 128 generator, which is not Crypto Secure. Then from there, the Zoro Shiro Seed can be deduced by powerful calculators with enough user input into them. Overworld RNG is used for tons of stuff. It's advanced by NPCs, weather, and... I would talk more about this, but I didn't end up needing it for this challenge at all. The overworld RNG is really cool. You can use it to manip wild Pokemon, the Kremlmatic uh, Pokeballs, and even the lottery. If you're interested, you can find out more in this video I made in the card above. Now, raids are kind of weird. Their seed is generated via crypto when you throw a wishing piece into a den. From there, it only advances forward when a day rolls over. In addition, the raid species and star number are only decided by crypto, and they're not decided by Zoro Shiro at all. On top of that, the species and stars of the current day the day after and the day after tomorrow are all predetermined. Day 4 and onward are not though, so you can change the species of day 4 by checking it and resetting if you don't like what you see. But how do you do this? Well, our friend the day skip glitch, of course. Normally, Sword and Shield prevent tampering with the Switch's internal clock, but you can circumvent this in two different ways. The first is the Raid Battle menu. If you click Invite Others and then go to the Switch's homepage, you can move the day forward once. And after that, if you return to the game and cancel Invite Others, you'll have advanced forward one day. The other way is by turning on Airplane Mode while in a Wi-Fi or local battle. If you do this, you can go into the Switch's menu and skip as many days in a row as you'd like. It's a lot faster to do this method, but it can be a bit unstable in the wild area, so you'll have to do it in a Poke Center. Both methods have their advantages. Typically, I use the first method when determining my seed because it doesn't have a lot of setup time, and then I use the second when I need to do a lot of day skips to get the Pokemon that I want. Let's use Ditto as an example here to show you how this RNG works. The first thing I do is throw in my wishing piece into the den and make sure it's a rare beam by using some good old fashioned save scumming. Then after that, I use the invite others method of day skipping to advance the RNG forward by three days. So I'm now on day four. At this point, I consult Lean Seed Searcher. This is a calculator that runs on my computer and does not connect with my Switch in any way. I input what raid den I'm at and and Lean Seed Searcher tells me what type of raid is acceptable. It needs raids with the least amount of guaranteed 31 IVs possible, so only a 3 or 4 star ditto that has 3 31 IVs will do. If I don't have the right ditto on day 4, that's fine. I just turn off the game and then do 3 new day advances. Day 4 can change on a reset, so I just do that until I see the 3 star ditto. Then, I catch it and using the IV calculator built into Lean Searcher, along with the EXP candies that I farmed, I figure out ditto's exact IVs. After that, we need to calculate an IV shift, which is what IVs become 31 if day 4 has 4 guaranteed 31 IVs instead of 3. So I turn off the game and get to day 4 and do the same calculations but with a stronger ditto. After that, the last thing I need to do is calculate the day 5 and day 6 dittos, and they can be any stars. Once that's done, I just search for my seed. After a minute or so, it finds my seed and I can reset my game and begin the advancements. My ditto is like 600 days away, meaning I'll be doing the fast date skip. So I head to a Poke Center in Wedgehurst and I go to Wi-Fi Battle and I put the switch into airplane mode. And now I'm in the glitch. At this point, I can just stay in the switch's date menu and spam. This takes a long time and I always try to under advance. In the end, I'm about 40 away from Ditto, and I do the rest in the wild area using a controller instead of this touch screen that I've been doing here. After all that day skipping, I end up with my 6 IV Ditto for breeding. All in all, this took me 1 hour and 11 minutes. Not the fastest method of RNG ever, but at least it's consistent. Up next, I decided to give my wrists a break and do some breeding to relax. The first thing I did was grab a Destiny Knot for 10 BP from the Lady in Hammerlock. I already had the BP from my earlier Battle Tower escapades. This increases the amount of IVs my parents will pass down. They'll now pass down 5 collective IVs instead of three, which is a really big improvement. Then, I snagged a Roly Coley for the ability Steam Engine, which increases the speed that eggs hatch if you put that Pokemon in the front of your party. Lastly, I got the Egg Charm from Masuda. This increases the rate at which eggs appear in the daycare, and you get it by battling him in a double battle after you defeat the Elite Four. I think that's all the items I need for my breed. I also already had an Everstone from the floor in one of the wild areas somewhere. Oh, actually, I need a Litten. At some point during my EXP candy farming, someone traded me a hidden ability Litten. It also came with the two most popular egg moves, Parting Shot and Fake Out, which I would need, but it didn't have 
have any 31 IVs at all, and it had the wrong nature, so I figured that it was acceptable for this challenge. The general process for breeding went like this. First, I'd put a Litten and the Ditto with the Destiny Knot in the daycare together, and then I would just spam eggs until I got the nature I wanted. Eventually, an Impish Litten popped out. After that, I put the Impish Litten in the daycare with the Ditto and gave it an Everstone. From there, I would just hatch new Litten, and if their stats were better than the current Litten in the daycare, I would swap the two. Rinse and repeat until I've got a 6 IV Impish Litten with Intimidate. This took about an hour and 15 minutes, although I am including all the item acquisition in Litten's time. On to Grookey. The thing about Grookey though is, I don't have a hidden ability Grookey to breed with, so I'll have to use the ability patch item on it later. Otherwise, it's about the same as Lit. Start with the parents, ditto in my Rillaboom, and spam breed until I end up with my adamant nature Grookey. After that, I swap Grookey in until I've got my 5 IV adamant Grookey. It actually also needs an egg move, but this isn't a problem. Sword and Shield have this awesome feature where you can share egg moves of the same species Pokemon to each other. So all I had to do was take one of the random female Grookeys I had from all the eggs I bred and breed it with my Litten, who had Fake Out. Then, the egg they produce is a Grookey with that move. After that, all I have to do is make sure my 6 IV adamant Grookey has a move slot free and put it in the daycare with the Fake Out Grookey. After running around a bit, Fake Out is transferred to my 6 IV Grookey, and he's all done for now. That took around 49 minutes, not too shabby. And I have to say, breeding in these games is just so fun. It was fun in Gen 6, it's fun here. 49 minutes is not an unreasonable amount of time to get an egg. I don't think anyway. On to the final member of the team, Gastrodon. Gastrodon is pretty much the exact same as Ditto. I have to do a raid RNG for it because it has a speed of 8 and an attack of 0, neither of which I can bottle cap for or manipulate in any other way besides a raid. So I do my seed finding process and skip about 1500 days and bam, I've got my Gastrodon. This took a really long time, 2 hours and 57 minutes. Part of the reason was that I got really unlucky finding my starting Pokemon for this den, and then I had to do 1500 manual day skips, which is a lot. I had to pause a few times to break from my hands. And on top of all this, while it does have the perfect HP defense, special attack, and special defense it needs, and the 8 in speed and 0 in attack it needs, the nature is wrong, so I'll actually have to mint it later on. In addition, right after I got the Gastrodon, since I no longer needed EXP candies for IV calculations for raids, I used almost all the ones I had up on Thunderous, Calyrex, and Zacian to get them all to level 100 for bottle cap usage later on. And that's all five members of the team. Well, wait, five? Right, Zacian. Edu's team has Zacian on it. I already have this Pokemon from the casual story mode playthrough, so I do have all six Pokemon that I need. I will need to clear its EVs via Lady Clear in the Isle of Armor later, and I'll also need to cap and mint it. Now, I technically have every Pokemon I need, but they're not perfect yet. I've never done this challenge before and collected all six Pokemon and had them not have perfect IVs, the natures they need, or the abilities they need. So this is going to make comparing a little bit difficult, but here's how I'll do it. I'll compare right now how long it took me to how long it took me to get all the Pokemon in Gen 6 via Wolf's team, and then after I mint, cap, and patch them, I'll add the time it took to get all the mints, all the caps, and all the patches, and I'll add that back on and see if it was actually an improvement. So as it stands right now, they took me 10 hours and 4 minutes to get, which isn't too bad, although 5 out of the 6 of them need tweaking in some way. Compare this to Wolf's team, where there is no minting or capping, this took 47 hours and 8 minutes. Oh boy. I think Jade 8 made a lot of improvements here, even if I'm going to have to fix this stuff up later. Anyway, our new total time is now 11 hours and 8 minutes. Up next is EV training. So before I can actually start EV training, I have to talk about some of the changes Gen 8 made to a few of the mechanics and how EV training works in these games in general. I'll be using two different techniques to EV train in these games, Pokemon KOs and Vitamins. Let's talk about Vitamins first. Until Sword and Shield, the various Vitamin items like HP Up or Carbos would give you 10 EVs per use, but they would no longer grant EVs in that stat once you've reached 100 EVs or more in it. This was changed in Sword and Shield, and it is now uncapped. In addition, before Gen 6, a stat could have up to 255 EVs in it, but because EVs are calculated in fours, aka aka every four points your stat goes up by one, this would actually waste three EVs because 255 is not divisible by four. But starting in Gen 6, they capped EVs in an individual stat at 252, which is divisible by four. These two mechanics mean that you can fully EV train a stat by buying 26 vitamins and just dumping them all into a Pokemon. There are some catches to this though. The first one is that it's expensive. Vitamins are 10,000 Poké dollars a pop. I know you can get the cheaper prices by doing the Watt farming at the dojo in the Isle of Armor. However, Watt farming without the day skip glitch would take weeks so I thought this would be faster to just buy them at full price. The second is that, well, if you take a look at Edu's team, only two Pokemon have stats that are easy to EV train with only vitamins, Calyrex and Thunderous. Everything else has a bunch of specific EVs that are all lower than 10, which is what vitamins give. The way I deal with those stats that need less than 10 in specific spots, well, it's Pokemon KOs. They haven't changed at all functionally, but I utilize them differently. Before, this was the main way I would go about EV training. I would get Poke Ross and special items to increase the amount of EVs a Pokemon KO would give me. This time, they're just for cleanup, really. I would use them to get one or two EVs here or there after training with the vitamins. The way Pokemon KOs work is every time you KO a Pokemon, they give a specific amount of EV 
EVs according to what species they are. For example, Machoke gives two attack EVs every time you KO it. So the general EV training process that I would use is to give Pokemon the vitamins they would need in every stat up to multiples of 10. For example, Edu's Incineroar needs 124 EVs in defense, so I would give it 12 irons, which grants it 120 EVs in defense. Then I find Pokemon that gives defense EVs on KO and take that out. In this case, I would KO four Roly Colies because they each give one defense EV per KO. Pretty simple this gen, I think. So about the money, what am I going to do about it? Well, the most popular way to farm money in these games is what's known as Watt Exchanging. You see, if you find a seller in the wild area who can sell luxury balls to you, you could buy them with Watts, which is a currency you get for interacting with raid dens and doing various other things. Then you could sell them for money at a Pokemart. Selling 999 luxury balls this way leads you to getting 1.5 million Poke Dollars, which is a lot of money. Initially, I was worried about the speed and consistency of this method without using the date skip trick, because Watt farming is not super duper fast, so I decided it might be faster to try the older method using G-Max Meowth and its move, G-Max Gold Rush. This move, when you use it in battle, grants you 99,999 Poke Dollars if you're at level 100. And so what I did was got the Cantonian Meowth from the in-game trade and I fed it three Max Mushrooms, which I already had in my inventory from doing the Isle of Armor story, since I had never used them to G-Max or Shifu. After that, I spammed raids for EXP candies, and after one hour and 47 minutes of raid spamming, I got Meowth to level 100 and I used it to take on the Elite Four tournament. The bad news is doing a full run of the Elite Four this way, spamming the Max move with the Amulet coin, only nets me about 400,000 Poke Dollars. Whereas to fully EV train a Pokemon, the minimum is about 520,000 Poke Dollars. So I set to work grinding, and I got enough money to train like three Pokemon on my team, but just as the monotony was kicking in, my friend Hefe stepped into the rescue. As you may have noticed during most of this video, there's been text on the bottom of the screen that says, I'm looking for Delibird raids from people. Delibird in the Crown Tundra has the chance to give a bunch of super good rewards, including bottle caps, PP ups, PP maxes, and nuggets and all of the EXP candies. So after a bit of looking, my friend Hefe found a 4-star Delibird raid, which dies to two Behemoth Blades, one from Maizashian and one from his. So we began to grind. I need to hyper train six stats on my legendaries, so I'll need six bottle caps. I already have two, one from a battle tower reward and one from the ground in one of the wild areas. The way this works is my friend hosts the raid and sets a code to invite me. We do the raid together and I get the rewards, but if he doesn't save and then turns off his game, the raid is still there for him, so he can host it again for me and do that repeatedly until I get all the things I need out of it. To me, this is similar to soft resetting for a legendary, but a friend is helping me instead. But maybe you disagree and you feel this is a glitch or something like that. Do you feel it violated the spirit of this run? Let me know in the comments. So, after I finished hyper training, I got back to EV training. This whole detour took me about 50 minutes to grind for the bottle caps that I needed. In addition, I decided Meowth farming was just too slow, and I spent all my watts on luxury balls. I figured at this point in the grind, I won't be needing too many technical records that I don't already have, and I checked all the salesmen, and none of them had any of the moves that I needed. So I bought the luxury balls, made $2 million, and began EV training. Alarex and Thunderous were the easiest. They were just full vitamin dumps. Thunderous took 26 proteins, 26 carbos, and 1 HP up. And Calyrex took 26 calcium, 26 carbos, and 1 HP up. And they were done. I don't even know how to time this. They each took like literally 5 seconds. <laughs> up next was Zacian, who needed 252 HP, 76 attack, 28 defense, 4 special defense, and 148 speed. So I gave it 26 HP ups, 7 proteins, 2 irons, and 14 carbos. After that, I KO'd 3 Machoke for 6 attack, 8 Roly Coley for defense, 4 Frillish for special defense, and then I gave him 1 more carbos to cap out its speed. This took me about 13 minutes. After Zacian was Gastrodon, and its EV spread is 180 HP, 92 defense, 92 special attack, and 144 special defense. So I gave it 18 HP ups, 9 irons, 9 calcium, and 14 zinc. After that, I KO'd 2 Roly Coley and 1 Frozmoth, and then I finished up the training by giving it another zinc to cap out its special defense. This took 8 minutes, which is insanely fast. I mean, it just goes to show that Pokemon KOs here are really, really slow. They've really bogged Zacian down. Up next is Litten, whose EV spread is 244 HP, 4 attack, 124 defense, 108 special defense, and 28 speed. So I gave it 24 HP ups, 12 iron, 2 carbos, and 10 zinc. Then I KO'd 2 Wobbuffet in the wild area, 2 Machoke, 4 Roly Coley, and 8 Zigzagoon. And lastly, I gave it one more zinc to cap off its special defense. After that, I used EXP candies to get Litten to level 68, so it would both evolve and gain the move Flare Blitz. After that, it only needed one more move, so I gave it Throat Chop, a TR I had obtained several times through different raids that I had done. Now, Litten is actually all done. That took about 16 minutes in total for everything I listed there. By the way, I figured I would quickly mention here that Zacian is the one doing all of the Pokemon KOs. Since all Pokemon in your party gain EVs when a Pokemon is KO'd, weaker Pokemon like Litten at level 1 don't have to battle at all, and I just use Zacian for everything. Last up is the Grookster. Its EV spread is 244 HP, 196 attack, 4 defense, 
60 special defense, and 4 speed. So I gave it 24 HP ups, 19 proteins, and 6 zincs. After that, I KO'd 2 Wobbuffet, 4 Roly Coley, and 4 Zigzagoon. Then, I gave it 1 more protein to finish off its training. After that, I also spammed EXP candies, just like with Litten, until it was level 69, where it learned knockoff at whatever level it needed to do that at. That in all took 10 minutes. Really quick. All in all, EV training and hyper training took 4 hours and 23 minutes. This took a bit longer than the Gen 6 team builder, which was at 3 hours and 27 minutes at this point. But this is really only because of the detour I took for hyper training. So if you don't count that, the games were dead even, and Sword and Shield was only 5 minutes slower. Despite the speed of the vitamins, you either have to do a lot of raid grinding or lots of G-Max Meowth money farming to EV train using them, so they didn't save as much time as I thought they would. I actually think the biggest time saver in all of this is not having to get the power items. I didn't use them at all, and that saves the usual lengthy battle tower grind. With all this being done, our total playthrough time with a fully EV and hyper trained team were at 15 hours and 32 minutes. This has gone fairly smoothly so far, honestly. I was expecting it to be a lot rougher without the day skip glitch, but it's been really nice so far. So up next, I want to finish giving everyone their proper movesets. Incineroar is done already, but everyone else needs a few different moves and their items. First up was Thunderous. Thunderous needed Wild Charge, Fly, Protect, Taunt, and the Life Orb. I already had Wild Charge and Taunt from Raid Grinding earlier, and I just needed to head to Motostoke to buy Protect, and then Stow on side to get Fly. In addition, I already had two Life Orbs that I had just picked up from the floor in the Crown Tundra, so I gave one of them to him. And that's Thunderous' moveset and items done. Next up was Calyrex, who needs Astral Barrage, Snarl, Will-O-Wisp, and Protect. It comes with Astral Barrage on its moveset already, and I already had Snarl, Will-O-Wisp, and the Protect TMs. Last was the item, Focus Sash, which I had also already picked up from the floor in the Crown Tundra somewhere. Man, the moves and items are really easy in this game, especially once the DLC is introduced. I, I didn't do anything, I got all of these just from grinding raids or playing the story naturally. On to Zacian, who needs Sacred Sword, Iron Head, Protect, and Substitute, along with the Rusted Sword item. Sacred Sword is a move reminder move, which is free in this game and is in every Poke Center, and it already knew Iron Head. Then, I taught it Protect via TM. Lastly was Substitute, which was a technical record I actually didn't already have, and it wasn't for sale anywhere. According to Cerebi, Noctowl's Den in Rolling Fields can give it 100% of the time. So it took me a while to find it, but once I did, I got really lucky and the first thing that spawned when I threw a Wishing Piece in was Noctowl. So I quickly defeated it and got Substitute. And Zacian comes with its item, so I didn't need to do anything for that either. And Zacian's all done. Next up was Rillaboom. It needs Grassy Glide and High Horsepower. High Horsepower was a technical record I already had two of, and Grassy Glide is an Isle of Armor move tutor move that costs 5 Armorite Ore. And his moves are done. After that, I had to go to the Lake of Outrage to pick up his Assault Vest off the floor. And that's Grookey all finished up. Gastrodon is the final Pokemon who needs its items and moves all set. First, I fly to Giant Seat to pick up leftovers off the ground. Then, for its moves, I need Earth Power, Icy Wind, Yawn, and Protect. For Earth Power, I use the Move Reminder, and then for Icy Wind, I get the TM from a guy in Surchester. Then, I teach Protect from the TM I already have. Lastly is Yawn, which is an egg move. So I catch a Galarian Slowpoke, teach it Yawn, breed it into Gastrodon, and then use the egg move trick to share that yawn onto my already completed Gastrodon. And that's Gastrodon done. The only other thing worth mentioning here is the safety goggles for Incineroar. I must have found them on the floor in the wild area at some point. I don't remember buying them or anything like that, so I don't remember where I got them, but I had them and that is his item. With that, all five members of our team have all the moves they need and are all the level they need, with all of their items. This only took 43 minutes, which is kind of crazy. In Gen 6, this took 3 hours and 11 minutes. This is because even with Blissey bases in Gen 6, leveling here with the candies is really fast, and I basically already had all my moves from raids, and the items in Gen 6 were a pain to get because they were expensive BP items. In this game, they're just all over the floor. I literally didn't have to buy anything with battle points. This makes our new total time 16 hours and 15 minutes. On to the nature mints. Up next is getting the mints I needed to change my Pokemon's natures. I would need four total. A Timid Mint for Calyrex, a Jolly Mint for Thunderous, an Adamant Mint for Zacian, and a Calm Mint for Gastrodon. My strategy was this. Check both the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra for mints, and after that, spam the Battle Tower if they didn't give me anything good. The Battle Tower gives both BP to buy mints with, and gives a random mint as a reward every time you rank up. My first clears of the wild areas yielded no mints, so I hit the tower with my team. Since legendaries are allowed in the tower, I just started blasting through the doubles matches with Zacian and Calyrex. My first three rank ups were all mints that I didn't need. Modest, Serious, and Brave. So, I quit for the day and then I tried again the very next day, where I instantly got a calm mint on my first rank up. This is for Gastrodon. And then the very next one was the timid mint I needed for Calyrex. That's back-to-back -back mint gets from rank ups. After that, I realized I hadn't checked the wild areas yet today, so I flew to the Isle of Armor to begin checking for mints that could be there. And to my amazement, I found a sprig of adamant mint right away. I checked the rest of the Isle of Armor to no avail, but then I realized I had 92 BP, which is more than enough for one mint. So I flew back to the tower and bought a jolly mint, finishing off my nature quest. Getting all the mints in total took one hour and 20 24 minutes. 
not so bad. Although keep in mind, I did stop and wait until the mints respawned, which is technically like a day wait. But in just gameplay time, it's not so bad. Our current total now is 17 hours and 40 minutes. All right, so now that I have all my Pokemon with all their moves and all the right natures, I just have to get their moves to the max amount of power points. Before I begin this insane journey though, I actually have to finish up something really quick on Rillaboom. He's supposed to be able to Gigantamax, so I just need to get some max mushrooms to feed him G-Max soup. This took me like five minutes, not too bad at all. All right, so at this point, because of the Delibird raids and various other off the floor pickups, I already have two PP max and 19 PP ups. 2 PP Max and 18 PP Ups will actually fully finish 2 Pokemon already, so I only need 47 more PP Ups. I figured the best and most consistent way to get them would be the Cram-O-Matic. So, I spent some time trying to understand how the Cram-O-Matic works. It's a new feature in the Isle of Armor that can take up to 4 items you put into it and combine them to make a new single item. There's two main ways to get PP Ups from it. The first is a guaranteed formula. You put in, in this order, an Armorite Ore, anything, Armorite Ore, and Armorite Ore, and you'll always get a PP Up out of it. In addition, you could use Dynite Ore here instead, but I intentionally didn't use it because it's much more rare and I'll need it for something else later. The other main way of getting a PP up out of this thing is by putting items in that are worth a specific amount of points. You can find this list online and you need to put a total of 152 or more points in to get a PP up out of it. And this is what I started with. And my two main helpers here were Rare Candies and Silvali's Memories. They're all worth 40 each, so if you put four of them in, you'll get a PP up out. Unfortunately, I can't just use four rare candies, as that's a set formula for an ability capsule. So, my combo was three candies and a memory, and once I used all the Silvali memory ups, I used up some big nuggets, which are also worth 40 points. At that point, I was at 17 PP ups out of my 47 required. So, I started doing Isle of Armor raids for Armorite Ore for the set formula. Armorite Ore is an item you only get for doing raids in the Isle of Armor, and you usually get like one to three per raid that you do. So this was super grindy and boring, and I only did it until I had about 25 pieces of Armorite Ore. Once I used all of that up, I used the final rare candies I had by combining them with pieces of Comet Shard and Big Nuggets that were also raid rewards. At the end of all of that, I still only had 32 PP ups. I then figured to round this off, I would grind for BP in the Battle Tower because you can actually purchase PP ups for 10 BP in Hammerlock. And so I decided I would just hit max rank in the tower and blast off. That actually still wasn't enough. I had to do one final cram because I was only at 46 PP ups. I tossed in three rare candies and the ability capsule I won for getting max rank in the tower to get my final PP up. All in all, this took two hours and 17 minutes to get all the PP ups, which might be the fastest it's ever gone. In Gen 6, this took me 17 hours. Miserable. But now that we've finished that up, we're at 19 hours and 57 minutes. This is by far the fastest I've ever- You thought I forgot about ability patches, didn't you? Well, I didn't. This is a grind, so let's talk about it. I have two Pokemon who need their hidden ability, Thunderous, who needs Defiant, and Rillaboom, who needs Grassy Terrain. The only way to give a Pokemon its hidden ability when it didn't come with it is with the item Ability Patch, which was introduced in the Crown Tundra DLC. It costs 200 Dynite Ore per patch, and you can get Dynite Ore in four ways. Raids in any of the wild areas can give you them in small quantities, usually one to three. They can be found as random spawns on the ground in quantities of one. You can get them in varying quantities from doing Dynamax Adventure, and you can also get them in varying quantities from Endless Dynamax Adventure. Endless Dynamax Adventure is off limits to me, as to unlock it, you need to do all three quests from PN in the crown tundra which i didn't do this also leaves off the table the ability patch he gives you for catching necrozma so finding them on the floor is nice but it's not easily repeatable or fast it's just more of a bonus so that's out as my main method getting them in raids is a random quantity and it's also not particularly fast i've got 104 dynite or so far and that's from all the raids i've ever done in this entire playthrough so that left me the final method of regular dynamax adventures if you complete a raid and catch the legendary pokemon with friends online you get 13 total ore from it. 13. It can take anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes to complete an adventure. And that's if no one faints. It's 11 if a Pokemon faints ever during any part of the adventure. And then it's 9 if you don't catch the legendary at the end in case you wanted to shiny hunt it or something. And it's 5 if you fail the adventure. But that's what I did. I streamed for hours and hours with all of you in chat helping me out. So here's some highlights of that. I can't believe 1,000 arrows in the, the one turn did it literally more than half my health. Surely it's not. Oh, I might have selected Zygarde because I, I had to spam reconnect it. All right, well, we know now what we're in for, so we just have to try. Is let Mr. Mime Dynamax. 
We let it go all the way around. I shouldn't Dynamax here because I'm so weak. Yeah, we should Tailwind. Or maybe Burn first and then Tailwind. I think Burn first, Burn the Zygarde first, and then next turn Tailwind and then start spamming. And then we Screech with Seismitoad and then I'll start attacking. Yeah, use Reflect. Reflect is good. Reflect turn one. So we all have the equivalent of plus three defense right now, I think. Because the problem is Icy Wind is just going to be too weak without it being buffed by Dynamax. So we need Mr. Uh, we need Mr. Mime to be Dynamax. Look at that damage. Oh, we're going to win. We're going to win this time. I feel it. <laughs> Do you guys feel it? Do you feel it, Mr. Mi Mr. Krabs? <laughs> I think you should probably Screech again after that Seismitoad. Hit yourself. Go did. Go did. We're so lucky. Well, it hit itself in confusion two times in a row. Unreal. This has to be the best Zygarde fight to ever have been done. So that's minus six defense right now. So even though I'm burned, it's at minus six. So I'm effectively plus two. Get three. Oh, it's dead if I hit this last one. That was the cleanest Zygarde fight of all time. That was literally the easiest Zygarde fight of all time. Pure strategy. And that's that. Nine hours of grinding later, I had my two ability patches, and we have our total time. But first, let's add up the full Pokemon completion without EV training to see how long it took just to acquire six perfect IV, nature, and ability Pokemon. It took 21 hours and nine minutes to get those Pokemon, adding in the bottle cap, nature mints, and ability patches, in addition to the regular time it took to catch them. The rest was all EV training and item acquisition, and it was still way faster than the 48 hours of Gen 6. In fact, our total time of 29 hours and one minute was faster than the 48 hours of just catching Pokemon in Gen 6. Compare that to the 85 hours of Gen 6's total time, or the 60 hours of Gen 4's total time. With my other videos I've done on this, I tend to see them as the best case scenarios. Because I'm not hacking or glitching in them, I'm just doing RNG to manipulate the luck. In most instances, you could consider them something like, the luckiest player of all time catches and trains 6 Pokemon as fast as possible. Because those results would be possible without RNG manipulation. That's just luck after all. In most cases, it would have taken significantly longer than what I showcase in those videos. But here in Sword and Shield, I think this is closer to a worst case scenario. I didn't use any of the date skip tricks that everyone used, and I could have farmed mints and watts way faster. Same for leveling Pokemon up. I could have done it with Poke jobs and the day skipping and gotten them to level 100 in like two seconds. I also could have Lotto RNG for PP maxes, and that would have been much faster too. On top of these things, I didn't use Pokemon Home at all. And really, I could have gotten a hidden ability Grookey from a trade. But I like to try and do as much on my own as I can. And I don't think what I've shown here is really a misrepresentation at all. But even with this worst case scenario, this is a massive improvement. 29 hours is so much faster than anything I've done before, it's almost unbelievable. I think these games are massive of improvements, and I really think hacking at this point, especially if you're using the day skip trick, is actually unacceptable. You'll have tons of super useful items from normal play, and building a team in 29 hours is a super reasonable amount of time to build a team before a tournament. But it really could be a bit faster. To discuss how team building could be faster and potential improvements that could be made, I spoke to Kephotix, a prominent data miner, hack checker, and dev in the Pokemon community. He often ends up checking lots of teams from different players and worlds, and showcasing whether a given person hacks or not. And I thought gaining his perspective on the issue of in-game accessibility and cheating would be valuable. First, I wanted to know why someone who spends a lot of time hacking, making tools to hack, and data mining would be so outwardly opposed to hacking, and if you saw any hypocrisy in that. It's not hypocritical to data mine game data and shared teams, and then post my findings. Players agree to adhere to the official rules, and it's a neat finding to see where things are deviating. I've spent a lot of time working out the intricacies of how Pokemon data can be created and mutated in-game, and how it can be screwed up via external editors, and looking at data from others can reveal misbehaviors in my program or user errors that can be mitigated. I try to post my findings with facts first and leave opinions out. If they get offended by the facts, players that are cheating, wow, that's on them. I agree on this point. PK Hex is far more than a tool used to cheat in multiplayer competitions. People have been using hacks and cheats for single player stuff since the NES, and just because it's an option to cheat in multiplayer doesn't mean that you should. On top of that, I use it for legality checking and a bunch of other useful things like that, such as data management. Alright, so the next thing I wanted to know was what was your personal line for cheating, and what do you view as acceptable? I think a good mental exercise is having a 0 to 10 cheating skill, where behaviors and bypasses are graded from harmless to actionable to reprehensible. For example, 
a 0 is using an external simulator to play test with others, whereas a 10 would be peeking at RAM during PvP battles to gain advantage or lying to your fans about how you train your teams. Anything above a 6 is not really cool, so I guess that's my line. It's all still cheating according to the TOS of the developers anyway though. This is an interesting perspective to have, and one I also tend to agree with. I love RNG manipulation, and I don't really consider it cheating at all, but it's definitely outside the scope of normal gameplay. Players should not have to resort to anything external, but it can be frustrating otherwise. But if the developers consider all of this cheating, why have they not cracked down harder on it? Checking hacks beyond a surface level requires replicating the in-game behaviors available in a massive database of encounters. This is what PK Hex does. Can't take shortcuts, folks. Pokemon Company International can acknowledge or endorse external audits for a few reasons. A. It's a bad look when your official implementation is deficient. Like other multiplayer games, cheaters will research anti-cheat behavior and will make workarounds. B is... Endorsing community involvement with those operating in the not okay draws attention from press and viewers, educating them on capabilities outside of the black box gameplay. C is that they can't comment on the disciplinary actions taken because of privacy. I think it's good to avoid community stoning them further, but if they don't take any actions, it just emboldens others. D is effort. Companies have to pay employees, so the labor hours and audits for maintaining the team is likely not worth it to them. Game Freak poorly documents their game mechanics, so there needs to be a ton of internal research and training to be able to ensure the reports are actioned correctly. D is that cheating benefits the scene, so they can't clamp down on it. Minimal accessibility hurdles increases participation, so it's a benefit as long as the community self-polices and and ensures things are battle legal at a minimum. So with Game Freak unable to or not willing to make better hack checks, more bans, etc., the only solution to me seems to be to improve in-game accessibility, to make cheating not helpful or not very quick. What do you think the best way to do that is? And why haven't they done it sooner? Like every modern competitive multiplayer game, they need a sandbox sim. Unlock the sim of the post game with a small hurdle, or a microtransaction for instant access at the beginning of the game. Team builder, team coach sharing, and skippable slash short battle animations. Basically, a native Pokemon showdown. The storyline slash in-game event mechanics need to be completely divorced from PvP battles. Otherwise, players will cheat, and legitimate players will become disinterested. Incremental improvements will not disincentivize players who want to minimize grind time, as we've seen by the latest season's cheating stats. The numbers are even higher than what I reported, as people will play on ladder with cheated teams, play on showdowns, or cheat teams undetectably. I think Game Freak has already run an analysis on their in-game mechanics and restrictions in order to maximize hours played and copies purchased. They know how many people stick around after the end game and how many people buy the games regardless of quality, so long as there's enough new trinkets to play with. It's probably not worth their time to flesh out the ultra end game with quality of life features. That's why we get these band-aids of hyper training and mints. Relatively easy features to implement, but it's still a grind. Calling mints and bottle caps band-aids is the perfect descriptor of them. They add these insanely useful items only to lock them behind rarity, or a battle point grind, or a level grind. Really frustrating from my perspective, honestly. So, how often do you play, and what's your investment in all of this? Lowering the barriers to enjoy gameplay is a motivator. I get to put Pokemon sellers out of business, or at least really hamper their operations with trade bots being as ubiquitous as they now are. If PK hacks didn't exist, there'd be other tools to fill the void. The viewers though, and laughing at bad hacks and players not having the out of battle knowledge is good drama. In the past decade, I've probably played the game less than 40 hours in total. I prefer to play other games. I spend quite a bit of time not playing these games, be that reverse engineering, programmer, etc. I don't care if people cheat, I have zero mental interest in playing the games. I just find it funny to out two-faced players. I'm legit trying Trust me bro, I'm so good at this game. Try and convince the game developers their improvements are falling short, and reduce accessibility issues. Distribution bots, mechanics research like RNG, providing tools plus info to modify data, so that cheaters have as small of an advantage as possible. Does cheating give an advantage? Absolutely. Time and velocity of information slash learning. Injected teams and external simulator battles are not available to legitimate players, so the amount of time required for equivalent competency, like player skill, team quality and synergy is different. We do not have infinite time, even if we were able to take it from others. Stuff like traded teams from friends or fans. The best games are those that are accessible to all with no barriers to entry. Shout out to games like Dota 2 where all the characters and items are available to choose and each match carries over nothing from the previous games. Player skill and mentality is all that matters. So, to summarize, Game Freak doesn't have the time or incentive to out cheaters publicly, make stricter hack checking tools, or improve the post game with a built in sim like Pokemon Showdown. Because of all of this, I fear we will never get something much better than Sword and Shield insofar as team acquisition goes, and I worry this will hurt Scarlet and Violet's accessibility. In the end, I just want people to be able to play normally and not have to resort to cheating or hacking. Here's hoping. Until next time, everyone, see ya. I hope everybody enjoyed the video. I have more coming in Scarlet and Violet, so I hope you're excited for that. With that said, I want to give a big special shout out to my YouTube channel members. Thank you guys so much. Your generosity and your support is unbelievable. I couldn't continue making videos like this without all of you. I want to do a special shout out to my Blissy tier members, AB Twisty and Fragiles, and an even bigger shout out to my Bliss God tier members, 
R-L-I-Z-T, and Shadow Blitz 56. Your generosity is unbelievable. Thank you so, so much. If you want to become a channel member, you can hit the join button down below. It's as low as $1.99 a month, and it gets you access to a special server in my Discord. My video is early. The challenge is VODs for this, so you could see me do all of it live as if I was streaming, and so much more. Thank you so much. See you guys later.